Welcome to my presentation about plasmon-induced hot electron photodetectors. First let's review what we've already known about plasmon. While volume plasmon in bulk materials suffer from high loss, surface plasmons, which appear at the boundary between metal and dielectric material, can propagate for longer distance. Most of the field is inside dielectric material, so loss is not a big issue. However, surface plasmon cannot propagate along the surface for arbitrary length. It still suffers from decay. The decaying effects can be classified in two classes. One is radiative, which means that photons are regenerated and emitted. The second is non-radiative. Here the field gives its energy to electrons inside the material. Here we will mainly focus on non-radiative decay, since that's what we're going to make use of. We're not very interested in the radiative decay. So when the surface plasmon decays, its energy goes to electrons, lifting the electron energy above Fermi level, leaving a hole behind. This can be used to construct photodetectors. When we want to detect some incident photons, a typical way to do this is to convert light into current, so that we can measure the current. For example a very simple photodiode can be constructed using a PN junction. Initially, the electron distribution is close to a step function, all states under Fermi level are occupied. This is called the Fermi-Dirac distribution. So as we can see in the figure, when some electrons are given enough energy, the population of electrons will become different. Some electrons go up above the Fermi level, so the electron distribution is no longer like a step function. This picture gives us some intuition of the phrase hot electron, since the curved electron distribution is similar to the equilibrium electron distribution at high temperature. Note that this is not an equilibrium state, so after some time, the electrons will fall back and recombine with these holes, and the system will go back to equilibrium. So how do we collect these hot electrons before they lose their energy? Only in that way we can use it to detect photons. This is achieved by placing semiconductor very close to the metal. Let's take n-type semiconductor as an example. Before contact the Fermi level inside metal and semiconductor are not necessarily the same. However after contact, these two should match, which results in the bending of energy bands near the interface. So if some electron in metal wants to enter the semiconductor, go into the conduction band, it needs to overcome a potential barrier. This barrier is often referred to as Schottky barrier. Most electrons inside the metal cannot easily go through the barrier, thus cannot enter semiconductor. Only those electrons with enough kinetic energy, can tunnel through the barrier. Once inside the conduction band, we know that there are some carriers inside semiconductor, so if we add some voltage across the semiconductor, the current can be measured. We would naturally want a device with high efficiency, which means that energy given by incident photons can be effectively transferred to hot electrons, and finally leads to large current. This will give us a sensitive photodetector, with good responsivity. There are two major factors affecting this efficiency. The initial hot electron distribution, as well as the collection efficiency, which means how many hot electrons can go into the conduction band of semiconductor. Compared with conventional photodetectors, using surface plasmon-induced hot electron detectors have many benefits. The first thing is that plasmonic metallic nanoparticles can have very large absorption cross-section, compared with their geometry size. Therefore more photons can be captured. This large cross-section thing is actually quite interesting. For example, here we have an aluminum particle, whose radius, A, is much smaller compared with wavelength. The pointing vectors at different locations are plotted, you can see these lines. The energy of incident light goes to this particle, and the absorption cross-section appears much larger than its geometrical cross-section. The second benefit is that plasmon-induced hot electrons have higher average energy, making them easier to go through Schottky barrier. The last thing is that, only electrons with enough momentum in certain direction can go through barrier. For example in this figure, the momentum in z-direction, denoted as pz, should be large enough. 
If the momentum of electrons have some uniform distribution among all directions, then only a small portion of electrons are useful. However, by tuning the surface plasmon modes, people can modify the momentum distribution, and make the whole process more efficient. Here's an example, one of the earliest works of this type of photodetectors. Gold antenna serves as plasmonic structure. By tuning the length of nano rods, the responsivity can be changed, as shown in this figure. Here's another example. Instead of antennas, plasmonic gratings are used. Light incidence from the top, with polarization in this direction. This figure shows that responsivity depends on thickness of gold layer, denoted as T. When T equals 200 nanometers, the responsivity has a high peak. The figure on the right directly tells us that, by changing the interslit length denoted as D, we can change the peak of this responsivity to different wavelengths. Thus the photodetector design is flexible. Devices with different geometries can work under different wavelengths. There are many other relevant papers and I won't cover them here. We can see that the design of such photodetectors can be tricky. You see there are many important factors to consider. For example, you can have different size and geometry for the plasmonic structure. You also need to choose material for semiconductor part, and you need to take into consideration the band structure of that material. That's all. Thank you very much for listening. Welcome to my